What's up, y'all? How you doing? <laughs> yeah, it's about to get real. You know, you know what I'm saying. It's good. Hey, so excited to be here. I tell you what, it's kind of hard to follow, follow Gordon because he comes, I mean, this, this is the perfect series for him. Once upon a time, he comes out, he's got this gnarly beard, and he looks like Moses coming out with the tablets. You know, it's, it's amazing. It's like, I can't, I can't do that. I can't even grow a beard. It's like I got mange. I'm missing spots and stuff, you know? It just doesn't work for me. Okay, but let me tell you something. It's going to be an amazing, amazing series uh, just coming off of the first series, which was about the unforgiving debtor. And then we're going to move into the parable of the talents. But before I get started, you came in, you got a bulletin, you got this insert in your bulletin. Parents, guess what? We always talk about how we don't, you know, communication is, is difficult, right? Well, guess what? I'm communicating today. All right. You got an insert. It's got the Converge student camp. Okay, incoming sixth graders, that if, if you have a fifth grader and they're coming into sixth grade and current sixth grade to 12th grade, we got a camp coming up here in just a few months. We got 60 spots available. And let me tell you how much I love you, okay? Last year's camp was about $400. This year's camp is $100, okay? So we dropped the price so that we could have the experience here. It's a local camp, that kind of stuff. Listen to me. I want you to be able to, uh, to get your student involved. We've got a bunch of information for you at the information kiosk. If you are interested in, in getting your student signed up, go to the information kiosk after the service and pick up a brochure. And maybe some of you are going, well, I don't have students. I don't have kids, but I want to figure out how I can help. Guess what? I love you, and I want you to help. So, uh, again, all that information is at the information kiosk. You can get all that. Get it? Yeah, that's right. Okay, I'm working it. Yeah. Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at your notes. We're going to read through the scriptures. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the, to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with the two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and he called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the ground. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops and, did not, and didn't plant, and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm. Let's pray. Daddy, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that your spirit would just be in here, that you would just melt our heart, God, that you would give us a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone that's tilled up so that we can be able to plant the seed of your word in our hearts so that we may be able to produce fruit for you. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Listen, we are so glad you were here. Here's what I want you to do. I want to kind of give you a breakdown of this passage. Yes, the context of the passage is actually talking about money, but guess what? We're not talking about money today, Okay. The servants were giving, were giving uh, money to do something with, to invest with. But I want you to look at the, or I'm going to tell you about the Greek, the original Greek text. The meaning for talent is a measurement of weight. It's not so much coinage, it's a measurement of weight. And it is equivalent to about 75 pounds worth of, worth of change. 
It was a mass amount. But the English meaning for talent is a natural endowment or special ability. And that's what we are going to talk about today. We're going to look at this text from a different perspective. We're going to talk about what has God invested in you and your talents and abilities that you can be used for the kingdom of God. That's how we're going to look at this passage. We're going to break it down step by step, but we're going to look at it from the perspective of how has God equipped you for the kingdom. This is why I love, check it out, it's, why I, it's one of the reasons why I love having kids. It's instant sermon material. Instant sermon material. But as Jess and I have had the opportunity to have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, we are getting to see how God has designed them. And we get, we're getting to see some, some talents that, that, our, that, our, that our kids possess that they're starting to, to, haunt, to hone, to start haunting. Kyson, I'll, I'll use Kyson for an example. Kyson came out the womb beaten to a different drum. He just, he just, he's a drummer. That's what he's really good at. And if any of you have had the opportunity to see him drum, he really is good. I'm not just like telling you that. It's like, oh, my kid is awesome. He can drum. He can tap. No, he really can drum. It's, it's, it's pretty insane. He's got a full kit. He's practicing on it daily. He wakes up with drumsticks and he goes to bed with drumsticks. It's insane. It's really, it's really a cool concept. Now, Case, on the other hand, he's still, he's still young, trying to figure out exactly what he's, what he's capable of and what he's doing, but dude is straight comedy, okay? He is a comedian. He, is, he has become like, he started to develop this laugh that's kind of just strange, but makes you laugh at, at the same time, but at the same time, he's compassionate. Love this dude. He is so, so compassionate. I'm going, okay, God, what do you want to do, do with him? How do you want to shape him? What do you want to do with with these, you, you, have, you have put them in my care. How can I help them to discover what you have indeed equipped them with? And here's what we're seeing is the, the, as days go ahead, as days are, are moving, they are growing in their talents. And that's what I want to talk about today. If you look at your notes, it says, our talent will flourish when we choose to grow it. And we're going to look at that, the concept of growing. What does growing look like? Number one, Understanding that God gave you your talents. God gave you your talents. It says he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it into the proportion of their abilities. So the master is giving these servants talents based on the proportion of their abilities, what they are capable of doing. Whether you realize it or not, God has designed you and placed things in you to be used for the kingdom. Every single one of us has a talent. We've got some type of gift in us. What are we doing with it? That's the question. That's the thing we have to understand, to see there is something that God has given you that just makes you tick. There's something that you are capable of doing that if you couldn't do it, you wouldn't be able to live. You wouldn't be able to thrive. There's something that just gets you going in the morning. Like if you couldn't do whatever it is, fill in the blank, it would upset you. I love speaking. I love singing. I love leading worship. I love talking to people. I got the gift of gab, people, okay? I love talking. I like Comedy. I like making people laugh. I love being able to do these things. But here's the thing. We're all, we all have something, whether it's the gift of singing, playing an instrument, writing, rapping, dancing, speaking, fill in the blank. God has given you something, and it's something to be used to help glorify the Father, to help further the kingdom. Again, like I was talking about, Kyson, Kyson came out of the womb playing the drums. That's just how he ticks, and he's really good at it, and I want to help him develop those things. Look at your notes. It says, every good and perfect gift, listen to me, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. Every good, I want you to underline, every good and perfect gift every good and perfect gift. If God calls it good, then obviously it's what? Good. If it's perfect and God is perfect, what does that mean? Then it's perfect. And God is saying, listen, I have blessed you with this. But here's what I've come to, come to realize. We start comparing ourselves to people. Come on. We start comparing ourselves and say, well, I don't have that gift, so I must not be okay. 
Well, I ain't got that gift, so God can't use me. And all of a sudden, we start playing the comparison game. And we start thinking, well, if I don't have this certain gift, then I can't be used. When God is saying, listen, every good and every perfect gift is from me, so I want you to use it. I want you to use it. Because guess what? It ain't about you. Uh, yeah. It ain't about you. It's about me. And it's about what I want to do in and through you. So here's what we got to do. We got to stop playing the comparison game. And listen to me, don't miss this. And concentrate on the goodness of the gift giver as it pertains to the goodness of your gift. We got to start concentrating on the goodness of the giver as it pertains to my gift. Because as I start understanding what my gift is, I know that every good and perfect gift is from above. Amen? Number two, check this out. We got to understand that responsibility, responsibility is given to you by God for your talents. Responsibility is given to you by God for your talents. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He called together his servants and entrusted. I want you to circle that word entrusted. Circle that word entrusted. Entrusted means that he has given us responsibility for the things that we now possess. Romans 14, 12 says this, it says, though then... Each of us will give an account for what we have done with what God has given us. Think about that for a moment. If God has given you something that is of value and that is as important, we might want to do our due diligence to make sure that we are taking responsibility for what it is that God has given us. Because he said everyone will give an account. Everything that God has entrusted to you, everything, Everything means everything. All means all, and that's all all means, right? All, everything. So the things that you think you possess that are yours ain't yours. You didn't, get, you didn't come in the world with nothing. You ain't going to leave with nothing, right? So God is saying that the things that I have given you, I want you to use for me because I have blessed. Listen to me. I'm going I'm to keep preaching. Every good and perfect gift is from above. So as God has placed and entrusted responsibility in us, Man, we got to make sure we're doing what God has called us to do with those resources. Amen? So check this out. It says, everyone, listen to me, everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Everyone to whom much was given, much will be required. God is saying, man, I've given you X, I've given you Y, Z, I've given you whatever, you're going to be held responsible for it. But here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to allow me to help put you in a position to be used. But we can't be used until we understand what it is that God has given us. So, responsible, we are responsible for two things. Number one, discovering your talents. Discover your talents. We are responsible to discover our talents. Let me tell you how this happens. Discovery of your talents will happen when you take inventory of what you are and are not good at. Sit down and ask God, how have you made me? How have you made me? What can I do that can benefit you? How have you shaped me? Man, we've got plenty of resources here at ORBC to help you figure out your shape called 301. I'm just kind of doing a little plug, okay? But I'm telling you, if you don't know how you're designed, we've got a way for you to know how you're designed. But there's also free resources that help you understand your gift shapes. God, how how have I been designed? How have you created me? And not only that, check this out. I want you to listen to the right people who are speaking into your life. That's why we have small groups, right? To people to do life with so they can help you understand who you are. But listen to what I said. Listen to the right people. Listen to the right people. Here's the deal. I'm going to break this down for you. The worst thing we can do is listen to people who aren't being honest with us. The worst thing we can do is listen to people who aren't honest with us, okay? Case in point. There are people who are called, and then there are mama called, right? There are people who got some gifts, 
And there are people who think they got gifts because mama said they got gifts. You know what I'm saying? And the one, I'm just going to call it out. I love you because this is the one that everybody thinks they can do and they can't. Not everybody can sing, y'all. I love you. I love you. But we got to stop it, okay? There are people that can usher you to the throne room, and then there's others that send you running from the room. You know what I'm saying? I love you. Listen to me. I'm just, but here's the deal. We got to be honest with ourselves. We have got to make sure that we are taking inventory of what God has given us. That's called being a good steward. Being a good steward. Listen, if you ain't good at something, that's okay. That's okay. Figure out what you are good at. Let God show you what you're good at. And then you need to use your talents. Once you know what you're good at and what, how God has shaped you, you discover them, and then you got to use them. Listen to me. It's not enough to know something, y'all. We got to start applying some stuff. We can know stuff, but knowing doesn't change anything. It's not until we start applying it that it starts to bring change in our life, right? So we got to start using our talents. Look at your notes. It says, the master was full of praise, full of praise. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. Now I'm going to give you more responsibilities. As we start honing in on our gifts, that allows us and sets us up for God to use us even more. And I don't know about you, but I won't create it to sit on the sidelines. You know what I'm saying? I'm going, God, I want you to use me. I want to make an impact for you. God, I want you to start helping me to understand how I'm made because you designed me to worship you in the way that you created me to worship you, which is going to move into our next point. Number three, operate in your design. Operate in your design. We're going to stay here for about a minute, okay? Because this is where I believe we get stuck. Here's where I believe we get stuck. See, it says, the servant who received five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to underline, began to invest, began to invest, and then secondly, went to work. Based on the text, it doesn't show, it doesn't tell us exactly how they did it. It said what they did, but they didn't say how they did it. But we can assume from the text that they were doing it based on how they were wired. It said one of them went and invested it. So obviously that brother was, was, was a numbers dude. He understands how things work. So he went and invested the money. He earned five more bags. I want to be that dude's friend. You know what I'm saying? Right? Come on, right? But the second guy, he said he went to work. Now, I didn't say what he did. Now, in the later text, he also said he invested it. But it didn't say how he went to work. But two of them, two guys did the same thing in the sense of investing their money, but they did it two different ways. You see where I'm going with this? We have to operate in our design. How has God shaped you? So here's what I want you to see. There are no broken designs. There's no broken designs. There's only broken systems. No broken designs, only broken systems. And the scripture is clear in Psalms 139. It says, for you created me in my inmost being. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Now, when you start thinking about how God designed you, he created you specifically for something, for a purpose. And that purpose can only be fulfilled in how God designed you. I still don't think you understand me. See, here's the deal. We live in a society where people try to place you in a box. If you don't look like this, talk like this, walk like this, act like this, then you ain't this. And God is saying, no, I have not created you that way. How I created the first servant is not necessarily how I created the second servant. I've designed you specifically to fulfill a purpose that only you can do. Here, here's what I'm saying. Here's, check this out. A broken system, trying to lose that donut by eating Krispy Kreme. <laughs> Think about that for a moment, okay? We're trying to lose 10 pounds on the Krispy Kreme diet, right? That's a broken system, y'all. It ain't working, okay? It's not working. 
another broken system, trying to get tanned from a can. <laughs> Come on, somebody, right? I've been there. I've done that, okay? You got people who got beautiful skin, and then you got me who can play hide-and-seek in a mayonnaise jar, <laughs> all right? Look, I ain't getting tanned, y'all. Me and the son, we got an agreement. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, okay? You leave me, I'll leave you alone. But think about it. We've got all these try to get quick fix stuff, right? We're trying to do stuff that, that, that was never intended for you possibly to do it. But we're trying to, to, to do things that wasn't based on our design. I'm always going to be white, okay? I can't be nothing but white. Now, I can try to get tan from a can, but I'm going to look like a carrot, okay? I prefer not to look like a carrot, all right? My wife, she gets tan, and I'm talking about like gingerbread dark. And it's awesome. It's cool. So we just got to work in our design. But here's the deal. Listen, and the only way I can help you understand this is this. There are broken systems. They're not broken designs. Okay, so when you're thinking about exercise, okay, you're thinking about who you are. You're thinking about, okay, I want to lose weight, all this kind of stuff. Well, listen to me. You got to understand how your body was designed. Okay, you've got endo or ectomorphs, Okay, that is, a, that is a design, a style. That's people that are normally pretty tall and, and real thin. You have mesomorphs who are very muscular in their tone. And then you've got endomorphs who are bigger in stature. Okay, that's a design, right? We're talking about bone structure. We're talking about how your body loses weight. But here's the deal. If you're trying to lose weight based on somebody else's design, you're defeating the purpose. Listen to me. I don't th you ain't hear me. If I'm trying to lose weight like a meso loses weight, but I'm an ecto, I'm defeating the purpose. But guess what had to happen? I had to be responsible to find out how I'm designed. If I wasn't designed to speak, but I was designed to be back behind the stage taking care of business by putting things on the screen, then I can't be out front trying to speak when I'm supposed to be behind the scenes taking care of business. And too many of us, listen to me, too many of us are trying to stay in a design by somebody else. Somebody else puts you in that design. But you got to start living how God created you to live. You still ain't getting it this morning. Let's, get, let's, let's, do, let's just get spiritual, okay? Let's go to the Bible, okay? Check this out. Here's the deal. <clears throat> what happened, as I get me a drink of water, <laughs> what happened when David went to meet Goliath? <clears throat> Saul tried to put on David Saul's armor. And David said, listen to me, I'm a shepherd. I can't fight in your armor. That ain't how God designed me. God designed me to walk up to that lion, grab him by the beard, and clock him in the noggin. I can't fight in your armor, Saul. You can't put me in your armor. I can't do what you do. I got to do what I do. And I got to keep living the way God called me to live. And I am going to operate the way God designed me, and that's to club Satan in the mouth with a sling shot and a stone. That's how I fight. That's how I fight with a sling shot and a stone. Sometimes you've got to figure out how God has wired you. In other words, check it out. What happened when they brought the Ark of the Covenant back in in the Old Testament? When David started bringing the Ark of the Covenant back in, God didn't receive it the first time because he did it based on tradition. So what did David do? David started dancing. David started dancing. He got out. He said, you know what, God, I'm going to worship you. I ain't going to worry about what nobody else thinks about me. I'm going to dance. I'm going to get all Pentecostal up in here, and I'm going to dance. I'm going to dance before the Lord. And guess what? Haters going to hate y'all because people are, oh, I'm about to preach up in here now. Check it out. People are afraid of what's different. People are afraid of what's different because guess what? All of a sudden, they meet somebody that's been in the presence of God and they start preaching that's different from anybody else, they start getting scared because they ain't never experienced that kind of stuff, right? But you got to operate the way God designs you to operate. I'm not going to preach like you. I ain't going to try to be you. You can't be me. God help you if you try to be me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? God help you. I don't want you to be me. And you want to know what? God does not want you to be me. God wants you to be like him. Can I get, come on, somebody. Come on. God wants you to be like him. But the only way that you can be like him is to understand how you are wired and made and designed to worship him. But that takes work, y'all. Listen to me. 
operating systems, okay? When you think about computers, operating systems are sometimes in need of an update. But guess what? The computer comes in all shapes and sizes. The computer is meant to do something. But sometimes it's the operating system that gets in the way of the computer being able to do what it was meant to do. And sometimes we need our operating system changed. That's why the scripture says, man, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Because your operating system is operating on sin when God is calling you to be transformed to live in the likeness of him. So why are you still sitting operating in a style that God has not called you to operate in? You want to be used for the kingdom? Then start worshiping him the way you were designed to worship him. Amen? And number four, work and watch. I'm going to do this real slow so we can do some writing. Work and watch or snooze and lose. Work and watch or snooze and lose. Check out what the scripture says on your notes. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. Now listen, let me tell you what this is not saying. That if you do with what God has given you, you're going to be rich. That is not what it's saying. We ain't talking about the prosperity gospel up in here. Okay? No, God said that if you use well with what God has given you, you will have many opportunities to use your gifts, which could then lead to more abundance. But that's not at all, again, it's not about you do this and this will happen. No, he's saying, listen to me, if you will work on your gifts, God will give you more opportunities to use your gifts. You want to be used more for the kingdom of God? Then what are you willing to do to make sure that you get to be used by God? See, we got a big problem. Big problem with that word called work in our society. Can I just preach a little bit? Is that okay? We got a problem in our society with the word work. When did we become so entitled that we believe somebody owes us something? Oh, oh, you just got real up in here. Yeah, it don't taste very good, but that's okay. No, we live in a society where it's like you owe me something. Let me tell you, I don't owe you jack. I don't owe you nothing. Okay? And let me tell you what. I'll never forget, man, there was this girl that we had in college, man. She was going through some kind of stuff or whatever. And, and all of a sudden, she started looking at Jess and I and said, you know what? God owes me. I was like, God owes you? God don't owe you nothing but a trip to hell, lady. <laughs> now, I didn't say that out loud, but I was thinking it. <laughs> Listen to me. When you think about perfection and you think about sin and what Christ did in order to pay for your sin, you think he owes you something? Come on, somebody. Man, you ever just heard somebody just say something dumb to you and, and, and like you got something inside of you, but you try to tell your face to stop it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you ain't said nothing, but your face is saying all they need to know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Come on, it's, it's not what's in me that's, that's a it's problem. It's my face I can't tell to stop it. That's like when, when this guy, you know, in the scripture said, well, I, I, I knew you were a harsh man. Well, if you knew he was a harsh man, why didn't you do something about it? Man, poor, I got I to gotta tell this. Man, Kyson, Kyson, man, I had to take care of business the other day. Man, Kyson just, I, I love him, man. He's strong-willed. He's type A. He's alpha male. I love it, but I have to just let him know I'm more alpha than you. And I had to take care of business, and all of a sudden, Case, here comes Case. You know, I was telling him he's compassionate. I love, he's just compassionate. love it. He said, Daddy. I said, what? He said, don't you spank my brother. I said, you want to spank him? And he felt so, it was like he just got defeated. He was like, I'm like, Kaisa, you on your own, bro. I tried to help, but I'm like, you, you just looked at him like, dude, this is not the time. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can, you can be, be compassionate, but this ain't the time to be compassionate because you're about to get his whooping. You know what I'm saying? Just some of those things that people just say to you and you just like telling your face, stop it. Like, just stop it. But that's the problem, y'all. We want things to just be handed to us. But here's what God said. Listen to me. Here's what God said. In, in, in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Actually, this is Paul telling Timothy, look, make sure you are studying the word to show yourself 
approved. Make sure that you are studying the word to show yourself approved. But here's what I believe we can get out of this. It says, work hard, y'all. Work hard. No, we don't have to work hard for his forgiveness. That's already been done. But he is saying, you want to please me? Work hard because there's blessing when you work hard. There's an abundance when you work hard. Going back to people thinking that you owe something. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what God did in Jess and I's life. Okay, we came in, got married, and I tell you what, school loans are stupid, okay? I'm just being real. But let me tell you something. If you take out a school loan, don't you tell me you want some debt forgiveness. No, you pay your debt, okay? That's biblical. But secondly, Jess and I, we were working, man. We, she, I had a sugar mama, you know, because I was going through school. Actually, it was like sugar water mama because we weren't really making that much. But it's okay. She was taking care of me. You know, she was taking care of while we were going through school. Well, let me tell you something. We racked up. Listen, we had like forty, forty-five thousand dollars $45,000 of debt. That's real money, people. Okay? That's real money. Real money. I'm going, God, how are we going to take care of this? He said, work hard. He said, work hard. So as I'm working hard, doing my school, doing my thing, and Jess is going to work, trying to take care of us as I'm going through school and finishing up. Let me tell you what God did. About four years ago, what, four or five years ago, man, we became debt-free. We're debt-free, y'all. I'm 33 years old, okay? That's about the point where Jesus died, so I'm like, ooh, like, like you know what I'm saying? But here's the deal. No, listen to me. We're debt-free. And guess what? Ain't nobody paid for my stuff. Jesus said, you work hard, and I will honor your hard work. But you can't expect that somebody's just going to give you something. That, oh, no, you got to work hard for it. And that's what I'm telling my little dudes, man. I'm telling my little boys, listen, you got to work hard. Ain't nobody going to just give you something, man. You can't come with that entitled, uh, that entitled attitude like you, uh, somebody owes you something. I don't owe you nothing, man. I love you. Like he, he told mama the other day, he said, mama, get me some cereal. I said, you done lost your mind. <laughs> get you some cereal. Number one, when you, when you move into that realm, you, now you're talking to my wife. That ain't your mama. That's my wife. Before you got here, she was my wife, okay? You are not going to be entitled. Nobody, if you want some cereal, you get your little self up, go in, the, go in the cupboard, and pour you some cereal. You old enough to take care of business. Listen, y'all, there's nothing wrong with hard work. God honors hard work. God honors hard work. But here's what he said, when you don't work hard, when you're willing to hide your gifts, when you don't want to possess the abilities that God has given you, listen to what he said. He said in Matthew 25, 20, but from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. I didn't say it. He said it. If you're not willing to work, listen, I'll tell you what, check this out. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says this, for even when we were with you, this is Paul talking, he said, we gave you this rule. The one who was unwilling to work Ain't going to eat. I don't know about you, but this brother hungry. Okay? I eat a whole lot. And I'm going to eat. But God is saying, listen to me. Working hard is a good thing. And he honors it. He honors it. Next point. Once you understand your talents, start investing them to honor God. Invest them to honor God. Look at your notes. It says, so you are eager to have special abilities the Spirit gives. Seek those that will strengthen the whole church. This is talking about the spiritual gifts as the Holy Spirit gives the spiritual gifts. But here's what we can learn and take away from this is that if you have abilities that God has possessed you with, he's saying, look, I want you to use it to invest them in the kingdom. I want you to do something for me with them. It is for the edification of the body. They're not just for you. Yes, I've placed them in your midst, but you need to be a good steward of them by strengthening the body. It says, in, in the book of Romans, it says, we are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Listen, what you possess, you might be the missing piece of somebody else's puzzle. You might be that piece of the puzzle that completes somebody else's puzzle. God is saying, I'm giving you something that may be for someone else else. But if you don't use them, guess what? That person doesn't get complete. So here's what I want you to think about. What has God given you? What can you conjure up to say, God, you have placed this in me. How can I best use it for you? Which leads me into my final point, because there's a whole lot of stuff. I want you to tell your story. Tell your story. Now, if many of you are going, what does my story have to do with gifts, right? Because your story is the greatest gift that God gave you. 
Your story is the greatest gift that God has given you. Remember, we talked about the Greek meaning, that Greek meaning, a measurement of weight, a measurement of weight. And then the English meaning special ability or natural endowment. Listen to what I want you to understand this. Your story has a huge weight and value as it pertains to its special ability to change lives because it is Christ in and through you that changes lives. Your story is the greatest gift that God has given you because guess what? It is unique and nobody else has another story like it. And your story that God has written in your life has the power to change lives. Look at what Romans uh, Revelation 12 says, it says, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony. And lastly, it says Roman, in Romans 10, it says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Listen, if we don't open our mouth, how will they ever hear? If we don't share, how will they ever be changed? God is saying, listen to me, I've done something so great in your life. Why would you not be willing to share your story with others? God has given you many gifts, but the greatest gift that he has given you besides Jesus Christ is your changed life. So how are you going to let God change your life so that he can use you to change somebody else's life? So you're going, well, what you want me to do, pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what I want you to do. Man, a couple years ago, we did something here at ORBC called Story, Sharing Your Story. Here's what I want you to do. If you've got, you got a cell phone, you got a, you got a smartphone, why don't you raise it up? It's okay. It's okay. If you got it, it's okay. Raise it up. Raise it up. There's a little flashlight on that deal. Turn that flashlight on real quick. It's okay. I'm giving you permission real quick because I'm about two, three minutes over. I got to hurry up, right? Boom. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, Right? <laughs> right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Come on with it. I, got, I see you back there with the lighter. Let's go, brother. I'm digging it. <laughs> Here's the deal. This is the greatest tool, one of the greatest tools that God has given you to be able to share your testimony. This is a light. This is a light. You have now the ability to communicate something via social media. So here's what I want you to do. This week, I want you to share your story. Go live. Do something on social media and say, this is what Christ has done in my life to change my life. And then I want you to hashtag story. Hashtag story on it so that it can get uh, some movement. And if you've already shared it, I want you to reshare it. Reshare it. Because listen to me. Your testimony is the greatest gift that God has given you. Amen? Let's pray. Daddy, we love you. God, thank you so much that you love us enough to give us life and to change our life. God, help us to use our story to change lives because you ultimately are the only one that can change lives. And all God's people said, amen.